is my sound working, my audio? Yep, can hear you fine, Bonnie. Thank you. Can somebody hear me? Yes. All right, but I can't see anybody now. I can hear you, Fabio. I cannot see anybody. Sound check for me. I can hear you, Ibrahim. Good. Hi, Heather. Heather's with us. Hi, Heather. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. It says my video has stopped. I don't know how to. Ib, are you on your computer or on your phone? No, I'm on my phone. I'm on my phone. I see you now. Do you? I can't see anybody. It says uh, your video is stopped. But I can see you. Well, that helps, but I can't see anybody. Hi, everyone. Uh, we have a quorum now, so we are ready to start the meeting. Uh, before I pass it on to Joe, uh, my name is Fabio Andrade, and I am a staff person here supporting the Human Rights Commission. I want to let participants know that we are starting a queue for those who want to provide public comments. So if you wish to provide public comments in this meeting, please make a statement using the Q&A options. We will compile a list and later on we'll call based on the order of requests received. Uh, before the public comments, we will have some guests speaking to the community and to the commission and we will introduce those soon. But before we start uh, with those, uh, with the listening session, uh, I will transfer it to the chair of the Human Rights Commission, Joel Ripoa, and they will discuss the agenda proposed for today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Fabio. Thank you to my fellow commissioners for your schedule to be with us here today. Um, and also thank you to all the participants that I see on screen for joining us for this, um, this special meeting. I'm quickly going to go through the agenda um, and ask if you have any questions or comments about the agenda, and then we'll proceed. Um, as a reminder to uh, our commissioners and also folks on the phone, if you can mute yourself and you're not talking, that would be really helpful. Um, and I'll probably have Fabio or someone else um, help me with folks as well. So we have today a, a pretty packed uh, um, Fabio, could you mute Eva, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, we've got a pretty packed agenda today, so we, we'll start off with um, hearing from NAACP. We also have uh, representatives from the BIPOC Collective, Black Uni, Blacks in Government, the Black-Led Action Coalition, um, and then possibly some BIPOC students um, from the University of Oregon and some other campuses as well. Um, and then we'll finish off with public comment. Uh, as a reminder to the folks, um, here we, we called today's special meeting in response to um, the variety of protests and manifestations happening across our city um, and in solidarity with manifestations happening across the country and across the globe um, for the fight for, for black lives and to end police brutality. We also know that there's been uh, a number of other issues happening, both with, with COVID disproportionately affecting BIPOC folks, as well as the rise of white supremacist and white nationalist activity in the midst of everything that's happening. Um, and we wanted to provide a opportunity for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color-led organizations who have been organizing, marching in the streets, an opportunity to come to us today and uh, talk to us about what, they, what they've been seeing, what they'd like to see in our city. 
Um, so before I proceed, is there, uh, oh, and um, one last reminder for our participants, if you are uh, going to sign up for public comment, I ask if um, you are black, indigenous, or identify as a person of color, that you please step forward. Um, this is, today's space was um, made um, to hear from folks um, from this community, so please feel free uh, to sign up. Also, if you do not feel comfortable turning on your camera, you don't have to. Um, I know that security is of great concern to some people who are organizing on the ground, and I know that activists have been targeted in the past um, by being public. So if you do not feel comfortable turning on your camera, you do not have to do so. Any revisions to today's agenda from folks? Okay. Can I get a motion to approve today's agenda? I move we approve today's agenda. Second. 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 Ibrahim, all those in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, we'll start off then with a... I have a question. Type it in the chat box, Serena. Um, so I... You want me to ask, raise my hand in the chat box? Go ahead, what's up? Oh, is the BIPOC collective the same as the BIPOC art collective? No. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Sure. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll start off with NAACP. So Eric, Eric is online. Uh, Eric is uh, right, uh, he's on call. Uh, can you unmute and put him on screen, Fabio? Yes, I will transfer all the speakers from attendees to the panelist group as their time comes. Perfect. So Eric is now allowed to turn on his video and speak. Okay. Uh, also, Joe, before we start, I just want to let the attendees know that everyone who is sending requests on the Q&A, we are getting your names and compiling the list. And towards half of the meeting, we'll read the order in which those will be allowed to speak after we go through the panelists. Perfect, thank you so much, Fabio. And I appreciate um, you, Eric, for being with us today. You have 10 minutes, the floor is yours. All right, I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna start my clock because I need to stop myself because I would get a little too carried away. But I just wanted to say thank you all uh, for the invitation. Uh, this is a very serious time that we are in uh, and a very serious uh, issue. The NAACP, as you all know, has been around for 111 years. And we were created with this very issue in mind, uh, extrajudicial killings of black people, women and children and others in trees, otherwise known as lynching. And that wasn't the only way black people were killed in this country, methodically. And you could probably go to the Eugene Public Library and find a book about the methods in which they use to restrain and kill black people. So I just wanna be clear about the formation of the United States and the debt that is owed to all people all human beings to correct the behavior of, of nations and of people in the powerful and to listen to the ancestors of the slave and to the slave themselves because we have record of slaves in bondage their whole life pleading for some type of consciousness on behalf of their oppressor. So this isn't a new subject matter. We're not talking about a policy with the police. We're talking about the national view, world view of the United States of America and Western culture at, in a whole, as a whole, which has presented to the world an idea that white men are the ultimate when it comes to human intelligence, endeavors, creation. And this fabricated idea is something that permeates all of our society. 
and it affects women of all colors because the idea is based on the idea of patriarchy, that the man is on top. And what the problem with that is that we know that creation comes through duality. Female, male, it's an equality of the, rate of the genders. And so that is a baseline. And if we are starting with the baseline not even recognized, then we have a problem. And we have a problem because slavery existed almost 200 years ago, and we're still dealing with the ramifications. So I just want to be clear that the NAACP is an old organization. In this conversation, the NAACP is an organization is an old organization. Myself, representing people from the black community at, at a 51 years old is considered old. Because if you went to the continent today and you looked at the average age of black people dying on the continent, an old person is 50 years old. Because on the continent where black originated, Injustice is thriving. So we need to think about this matter of, about black lives in a global sense. This is about demographic change. It's been about demographic change in Eugene for the last 10 years. Everybody knows it. We need to, 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 to go ahead and, and commit Take, we, we've taken a measurement, we know what's going on, and what it's going to take is resources. And it's going to take commitment to overturning a, a, a mental state of mind that some agree with and that has allowed for us to have a president such as we do. Because he, in many ways, is the archetype of a patriarch. A patriarch. And the things that he's, or he's talking about are the things that have supported that type of reality. And, it's, and everyone is saying, and saying so, but it need, we need to say so in, in many different ways. Through our curriculum, through our policies, through how we spend our money. So I just want to give it up to the, the younger folks who are here who are actually the impetus for this conversation uh, and the work that they're doing uh, and the passion that they are showing. I think, uh, you know, I have my own passion, but my passion is a little different. I have five children who I've raised in Eugene. I was raised in Eugene myself. I know what racism is firsthand. I know what it's like to be choked by the police in Eugene firsthand. So that doesn't mean that, that, that I'm gonna be the one leading this because there's work to do at home. I need to make sure that, our, our, that we have stability and that we have resources to, to bring to bear for our young people so that they can get involved with this, uh, this type of work as well. And so the, the NAACP is an institution. It is, a, it is something that is a tool that can be used that is 101 years old. These, the kids that we're gonna, the, excuse me, the young adults we're gonna hear from are, and these young leaders, they are the, the energy and the, the future uh, of any institution, including the NAACP, the city of Eugene. And we need uh, to hear from them. And not only that, we need to recruit them into our spaces so that uh, they can do the work that is necessary going forward. And so I, that's all I have to say. We are at the MIMS house. We do, we, we are working on our committee work, the health committee, the environmental justice committee, the Legal Redress Committee, the Education Committee, if you're interested in finances, the Development Committee. 
but we need to use the institutions and the structures that have been left to us by our ancestors. And there's not many of them. There are churches out there. There are fraternities, sororities. There's the NAACP, there's the Urban League. But those institutions have a base that is occupied by the wishes and aspiration of our ancestors. And they're asking for our help to get this job done because they know what the job is, is to eliminate race-based discrimination, is to give all people, the people sitting under the tree and the people in the big house, dignity. So uh, if you'd like to get a hold of us, 484-1119, we're at the historic Mims house. I think one of the best resources if you want to learn about the historic Mims House is just look, go to Mims House KLCC in a Google search. And KLCC has a number of stories and pictures and things about the Mims House that are very insightful. Um, and so I would just uh, thank you all for doing the work you, you do. And it's, it's amazing that we and Eugene have structures such as this and right across the bridge in Springfield, there's no such thing. I think that we need to start to spread uh, the good practices that we have in Eugene in many different ways to our neighbors and throughout the county. The county needs to get on board. And so- we have one minute, Eric. All right, so that's it. I wasn't even looking at my clock. Thank you. It looks like I'm right there. Um, anyway, I appreciate the time and uh, and I'm just a little passionate, the, the latest news that we had, we were running a summer camp at the house. We were having about 10, 12 kids per day. We ran it, this was the second week. Uh, today we had to suspend that camp because COVID-19 is real. And one of our uh, staff workers who was there the first two days of the camp last week did test positive uh, because he got, he got contacted through some contact tracing here in Eugene. Uh, he's, he's a 21 year old U of O student uh, that was working for us. Uh, he was never symptomatic. He was asymptomatic and still is asymptomatic, but he did test positive. Uh, so we canceled the camp today. So I'm a little wild up about that. It's a little, uh, it's interesting to have to do that. I'm very sad about it, uh, uh, but we're gonna continue to try to serve our community and the kids and the families there. Uh, and so that's it. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Eric. Appreciate you being with us. Uh, next we have, uh, we're gonna hear from the, the BIPOC Collective. I think we've got um, Dev and Kit from the BIPOC Collective. Yes, just one second, I'm transferring them from the attendees list to the panelist group. Thanks, Fabio. So Dev and Kit, uh, you would be able now to unmute yourselves and turn on your video. And you were sharing 10 minutes. Hey there, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Dev. Hi, my name is Kit and I use they them pronouns and we are a part of BIPOC Liberation Collective. I would first really like to thank you all for um, taking your time out and listening to us. Um, so I guess doing an overview of our 10 minutes, we're going to start off with an anecdote kind of listing why we stand by, why we stand by. And then after that, we are going to be introducing our groups and kind of the demands that we're looking for here in Eugene. So with that in mind, I'm going to give the mic to Dev. All right. Yeah, thanks, Kit. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'd like to share with you guys what I witnessed today. Um, during the sweeps of the houseless camps on 13th and Chambers and, and 14th and Chambers. Um, so this morning started with some residents um, from folks around the neighborhood bringing breakfast and coffee to the houseless folks. Um, We've been checking in with um, the two houseless camps in the area for the past few days trying to provide whatever assistance and resources um, we, could, we could get together because we knew about the upcoming sweeps that were supposed to happen. Um, you know, today or in the next few days. Um, around 11 a.m., myself and a friend helped 
a 66 year old houses man with debilitating back problems and a walker to pack up his tent and load it into a van so he could be transported away from the camp before the police arrived. His expression was distraught as he talked with us, trying to think of a place where he could go. Um, like about every individual, like about every other individual in the camps, um, the city has provided nowhere for him to go. Um, around 1130, cops began to congregate in the church parking lot near the camp. A short while after police arrived, an unidentified driver raced directly through the middle of the street where folks were camping, narrowly missing both houseless folks who were attempting to clean up their belongings and people who had come to help them clean up their belongings. In a brief conversation I had with two, two of the folks who had been living in that area, I was informed that this sort of intimidation was common and that last night someone had tried to run over a houseless person in their tent. Despite the clear violation of tra traffic laws displayed by the driver who had raced through the camp just minutes before, the police sat idly um, while the driver continued to race by six or more fully equipped police FU SUVs that were waiting down the street from the camp, um, prepared to begin this, the sweep in about a half an hour. At noon, approximately a dozen fully armed police promptly began to move toward one of the camps, backed with a bulldozer and the city parks cleanup crew. Behind them, a large van equipped to arrest large groups of people sat. Um, Community members asked over and over if the police would wait a few minutes so that folks could finish packing up their belonging, belongings before they were bulldozed. The police did their best to redirect community members who were asking the questions away from the situation and continued to move forward where they continued to harass the folks who were attempting to clean up their belongings. Many of the individuals who were not able to leave before the cops arrived were given tickets and are now expected to show up in court. At one point, while well, a cop was writing a ticket for one houseless individual. He tried to tell him that the courts were going to work with him. The individual responded, <laughs> saying, who was receiving this citation, responded saying to the officer that he knew the courts were not going to work with him and that he would, did not have the money to pay for the ticket, let alone any of the other ba basic necessities that he was lacking. That is a criminalization of poverty. The police's logic for what they were doing was that they had posted this for, for legitimizing what they were doing were that they had posted the sweeps that the sweeps were going on going to happen today. They failed to address the issue of where the campers were expected to move, despite being asked by the community time and time again. The bulldozer proceeded to smash and remove all remaining property from the camp that had not been moved out in the very short amount of time allotted. When activists asked the police why they were not storing the tents and other belongings in a safe place, as had been clearly stated on the, the sweet posting that had been around for, for multiple days, um, the police claimed that they were not anybody's property and that they had every right to crush and dispose of, of that. I spoke with a woman who arrived once the, sweep, the sweeps had already finished because she had had to bike across town um, to reach the location as she did not know when, when the sweeps were going to begin. Um, all of her belongings, including the clothes that she was not wearing that day had been bulldozed and taken to the dump at that point. Um, for some brief context, when a fence at the jail was partially torn down and a few police car windows smashed the other night at the jail, cops in full riot gear were sent in to protect the property. I didn't see any riot cops protecting this woman's property from the bulldozer that was funded by the city. These camps were originally designated to protect both the houseless community and the larger Eugene community from COVID as forcing houseless folks to constantly be on the move in this city is a threat to public health and a great way to spread COVID. At the moment, COVID rates are increasing in Oregon and the city has provided nowhere for these individuals to go. The city is actively endangering the public health of both the houseless community and the greater Eugene community through their actions. As I was leaving the area, two police tried to smile and wave at me. I took the, honor to, the opportunity to express my frustration with their actions and the sort of criminalization of poverty that they are participating in. One of the police women responded saying, where would you rather them go, your backyard? Little did she know that I live right down the street from these camps that were in no one's backyard apart from the usually empty military reserve building, um, just to let y'all know, and that many of the individuals who were camping in this camp away from, from houses 
had literally been camping in and right behind my backyard before these camps were established. The money spent on the police and equipment used for the sweep today was a waste of the city's resources and budget. These funds could have been spent on a multitude of other projects, including affordable public housing or even an empty parking lot for people to stay in until better facilities were made available. We need to defund the police. We need to abolish the police and put money into providing resources for the houseless community, for poor people, for people of color, for medical care, for de-escalation teams, for social workers, and other resources that are not being provided by the city to meet people's basic needs. Until these changes are made, Black, Indigenous, and POC folks will not be liberated and will continue to be criminalized and oppressed. Until these changes are made, houseless women of all races will continue to be raped, abused, and sold into sex slavery that is rampant up and down the I-5 corridor. Until these changes are made, LGBTQ plus individuals who end up on the streets due to their sexual orientation and gender will continue to be abused and oppressed by the police and by people in this community. All right, that's, that's just the, a little anecdote from today. That's where a lot of us have been spending pretty much our entire day. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to, to let folks really hear that and, and remember that the people who experience the majority of abuse from the police and, and, and um, oppression from the police are individuals in the houseless community, specifically black indigenous and POC folks in that houseless community. Um, yeah, Onion, do you wanna take it from here? Yes, thank you. Have you have two guys. minutes left. Okay. Me Thank you. So um, thank you for listening to that anecdote. It's kind of pointing out a couple of things. First of all, it's pointing out the intentional negligence of protection and safety of specific communities while showing, um, again, kind of the point of focusing on um, the general property being protected. So talking about demands, um, as you know, uh, with the city board of uh, the city council that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago with three hours of comments, um, the city council did not do very much in terms of amending a proposal and citizens and the constituents of Eugene should focus on the community safety initiative um, and which I'm pretty sure you all are aware about. It has a $9.8 million, $9 million budget um, and it is set to have 70% of its funds to police and um, the police department and law enforcement, uh, so the courts and stuff to process these things. Now, the issue with that is uh, it is it's adding to the issue of not um, funding for preventative care services, not funding um, harm reduction services, not funding housing services, which is one of the the biggest issues we have in Eugene and to basically halt um, to ask the community safety initiative to halt their funding to hold 5.6 million dollars and only a lot 3 million um, to only uh, to, to be only approved for the services that is either for the payroll tax implementation implementation the dust to dawn day resource centers homeless services homeless support homeless car camping services uh, places 15 night youth house uh, funding rest stop program funding library recreation youth inclusion and ambulance transport so those are the things that we are demanding are the only things that should be funded by the community safety initiative until there is a a better and more transparent way of showing how the police is spending their money and if it is actually an effective way for them to be using the money um, and existing in Eugene. Thanks Kit. Thanks Deb. Appreciate you all um, hopping on. Yeah thanks for giving us this time. Of course and um, feel free to you know send this stuff or if it's written down please feel free to send it um, our way in writing um, as well. Yeah we will. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we've got um, a spot, 10 minute spot for uh, U of O uh, BIPOC students. I have, I recognize some folks on the list, um, but <laughs> I don't want to call you all out. So if you are a student at the University of Oregon or LCC or a high school student um, and you would like to um, speak at this time, please put it in the chat box. 
I'll give it a, a minute. Okay. And I see some of you on this list. So if you uh, later on in public comment would like to give comments, you're welcome to do so. Um, in that case, I'll move on to uh, to Black Unity. I know we've got some folks on the line. Uh, we'll just wait for Fabio um, to transfer them over. We've got um, Tyshawn, Klee, and Claire. Oh, hi. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we're just waiting for okay. Tyshawn's on this cool. Yeah. I'm with me and Claire are together. This is Claire. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, appreciate y'all being with us this afternoon. Um, you've got 10 minutes. The floor is yours. Perfect. So <clears throat> my name is Clea. Um, sorry if you can't hear me very well. My voice is a little bit gone from last night. Um, but we wanted to, first of all, I'm gonna go ahead and state our mission statement here. It's that we seek change through the systematic reform of the criminal justice system and, impl and implicit stigmat stigmatization by the law enforcement. We fight to ensure that every person of color has the same opportunities of advancement as other community members and provide a safe space to voice their wants and needs as the people of color community in Eugene, Lane County and all of Oregon. Um, and then we also seek change through the systematic reform of criminal justice. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. Um, and, and we also demand that we are focused on dismantling the EPD and rebuilding a new prevention um, for protective system or rebuilding a new prevention and protective systems to take its place. And um, the legislation changes that we're looking for um, is, you know, part of the thing that we have you know, seen and seen statistics on is hate crimes have risen dramatically in Eugene by about 380%. And actually, I apologize for saying about um, from the years of 2013 to 2017. And subsequently, uh, placing Eugene on the map to be a city with the largest increase in hate crimes around the country. And in 2018, we saw a decrease in the total amount of reported crimes of bias, <clears throat> which dropped to uh, 42%. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> um, and due to alarming numbers of the hate crime in Eugene, we do demand that the state does pass legis legislation codifying hate crimes and extraordinary offenses, allowing our communities to prosecute the individuals who perpetrate these crimes of racism, implicit bias, and hatred. Um, and we also do demand that the state be required by written law to identify the KKK or Ku Klux Klan and its members as a terrorist organization because that's just huge. Um, and then one last thing for me, <clears throat> um, we do wanna be able to increase the funding of community centers and medical health services in Eugene, as well as establishing a facility built for minorities um, that is primarily led by people of color providers stationed here in Eugene. CAHOOTS responds to 17% of, e of the Eugene Police Department's calls, or they did in 2019. And for 2020, CAHOOTS just asked for a one-time budget increase of 281,000 um, to increase the availability services of, uh, that they do here in Eugene. We have seen this model in action and know it does work. And we demand a two, uh, permanent $2.2 million increase to CAHOOTS for operating budget so they can further respond to these calls. Um. That was Clea. Hi, my name is Claire. I am going to be um, speaking a little bit here, specifically on um, the path to demilitarization for Black Unity. Uh, Black Unity demands the removal of items such as tear gas, tanks, armed vehicles, and military grade weapons and calls for legislated making it illegal for police to use the weapons, lethal or not, against nonviolent protest. The police are not our military and we do not need to see officers with more equipment than a doctor, EMT, or social worker. Recent, pro recent peaceful protests have sh shown law enforcement's excessive use of force. Nonviolent protest involvement has helped keep us safe while marching through the streets and highways 
proving that we do not need these weapons to promote a peaceful community. We demand the end to racial bias. We, we want Oregon um, to require that all current police officers relinquish their badge. They must reapply for their licensures here in Oregon. As they reapply, in or as they reapply, Oregon must require each department to publicly release police records, introducing legislative banding departments for expunging police files and prosecuting cops that have committed crimes of bias. Our, re our reformed EPD must place an emphasis on cahoots by staffing mental health providers and social workers at the rate of one provider and one social worker per 500 residents. Our EPD must reduce its officers to one per one officer per every 3,000 residents, placing an emphasis on quality officers through an intense rehiring pro program, quality over quantity. In um, also reducing the roles that officers play, they only re respond to calls of action with a mental health of officials approval. In addition, they must require documentation when a cop pulls out a gun directed by a mental health expert. We want Eugene to become the model of equality for all Oregon and the United States. Claire, are you good? Yes, it is now your turn. Okay, I'm Tyshawn. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about community uh, representation so um, we demand legislation um, outlining the concession to broken windows and for-profit policing. Uh, we also demand the resources generated for these profits to be liquidated to improve the community. Black Unity believes these funds belong to the community and should be used to establish a community center, a medical clinic designed for and ran by Black and Indigenous people of color. Community here in Eugene, by funding access to community resources instead of broken window policing, and for-profit policing, Eugene will be investing in creating safe spaces in the very neighborhoods that they are policing by utilizing social services instead of militarization. Vulnerable populations would be to access other means of services leading to decrease of, oh, sorry. To the decrease in offenses, uh, this can help decrease the amount of bias and race, uh, racism minority community face on day-to-day -day basis in their own neighborhoods. We demand legislation creating social, medical, and community services and poverty-stricken strict, uh, minority communities. In Eugene nationwide, and nationwide, we are heavily dependent uh, on the support of white allies. The majority has the, they have the majority to, the majority has the power to inflict change, not the minority. The race war will not be won at the hands of black people alone. It will be won by black people by people of all colors joining together to force a disruption in the system and ultimately inflict change. And also another thing that we want to mention is how like um, the mayor, Mayor Lucy ben, uh, Venus came to our Juneteenth event, wanted to take pictures with us and everything. And then she um, voted against what we wanted. So just uh, holding like our political people with power accountable and make sure that they're, they, they don't want just a, um, a face in the community uh, just to see that they're for the people if they're not actually for the people. Thank you so much for um, allowing Black Unity to speak. Um, we wish we had more time, so we tried to put as much as we can in those 10 minutes. So um, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so much um, to the three of you for joining us today. Um, we do have public comment. We still have two minutes left, Joe. Thanks, Fabio. You all still have two minutes. <laughs> what was I saying? From here. I think that's everything that we prepared. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I appreciate you being here. And if there are other folks in your group that are, are on today, would like to provide public comment. Anno, are you on here? Do you want to speak? Yeah, if other folks are on, you know, I would say uh, for them to sign up for public comment so we can hear from them as well. Sure. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, well, the next group we have is uh, Blacks in Government. We'll wait for Fabio to transfer them over.
we have Linda Hamilton. And Linda, you should be able now to unmute yourself and use your video if you wish. Hey, Linda, you're on mute. Okay. Can you hear me now and see me? I can't see you too good. Could you try putting up your camera phone on your dashboard, maybe? Okay, I'm traveling, so I have to pull over. Awesome. <laughs> okay, can you see me? There we go. Yes. Wait a minute there. Wait, I'm, I'm going to pull over here. Okay. That's a little. Okay, just a second. Okay, I'll hold it. You there? Yeah, go ahead. I'm Linda. I'm Linda Hamilton. I'm the intern uh, president for Blacks in Government, which is for equity, excellence, and opportunity. And I would like to share life experience here in, in Eugene, Oregon. And I'm going to get this situated here. Okay. So I would like to share some life experience. We have a lot going on in this community um, lately, but I'm not here to talk about the George Floyd. I'm here to talk about, oh gosh, I'm here to share a little bit about things that have happened in our community in Lane County. Uh, and it's all related to, you know, what leads up to George Floyd. I moved here from Louisiana. Um, in 1990, April of 1990, I come to Eugene from Louisiana. And I left Louisiana because I had zero tolerance. As, as they say, and now I'm tired of racism. So I left Louisiana to get away from racism. I, I thought it was just ignorant in the South. But you learn real quick, it, it was a pandemic back then and it's a pandemic now. It's, racism is everywhere. And so I've, I've had to encounter racism in, in, through lawsuits in, in, in courts, through the Oregon State Bar of attorneys not representing people of color the way they should, providing evidence, um, police profiling blacks. Uh, so everything that's going on here that people are seeing today in the South has been a lot worse. Uh, and it never went away, history repeats itself. Eugene is a very good community. But Eugene has race issues. And a lot of those race issues are in government, government structural racism, structural institutional racism, power that they're not to let go and don't want to let go. And that's where a lot of that, the policy, you can say reform police, yes. Reform education, yes. Reform employment, yes reform whatever you come up with education police um employment health care you name it the people of color have suffered through it because a lot of it is those policies wasn't put in place for people of color they were put in place to maintain the power and they were put in place for the ku klux klan who still has the power a lot of this protesting and looting, a lot of that stuff out there are those hateful individuals who don't care for people of color. They, in my opinion, they have taken the George Floyd and turned it into their victory. They are not allies for the Blacks. Some of them are and some of them are not. They're not allies for people of color. Some of them are and some of them are not. We want you all to be allies for people of color, to say enough is enough and I'm tired, and be at the table. And what I mean by be at the table, you have to run for office. The power is at the table in offices, political offices where they're passing the laws, offices where they're making decisions on the hiring and firing, offices where they can make decisions around equity and look at the world and say, we gotta make this uh, for everyone. Offices where people have the right heart to say, I'm here for the people. And I'm here for all people, not just some people, but all people. Therefore, if, if that was the case, we wouldn't need Black Lives Matter because we would be at the table and we would be 
learned about at the table, we be making decisions that impact everyone and that's across the board for the good of everyone who have the people of interest at heart, at best heart, they would ask themselves, is it true? Is it good? And does it benefit all? And if it doesn't benefit all, then you don't, you don't go there. You don't, you don't, you don't pass bills that only benefit some and not all. You got to ask yourself those questions. And if you don't have the heart, we, we, we're not going to move forward. And this community is to protect and serve when it comes to police. And I have 33 years in public safety and I'm not no police in uniform. I love people. You can look up Linda and you, I probably blow up the internet, but I'm a little frustrated that we need people in political offices that are at the table that are, don't mind speaking up for the truth and not there for themselves or anybody else. They got to speak up for the people. They got to be a voice there for all. When I was on the Human Service Commission, I remember they didn't want to give Latino, that we had a big controversy over Latinos not getting funding at uh, Central Latino. I spoke up. I spoke up. And I'm not Latino. I love people. And you got to love people. I would have probably spoke up if it was for Blacks or anyone else or whites. When I worked in the Oregon State Penitentiary and the brutality was going on, I spoke up for a white male being beat down. A white male that caused me to go in the lawsuit and speak up for them. You have to love people for who they are and you got to meet them where they at. And so Blacks in Government is about equity, excellence, and opportunity. It's about professional development. You got to train a lot of this stuff that are happening in the world today is just straight out hate. It is not a training issue. 33 years, I've never had to pull my firearm on anybody. No one. It's not a training issue. It's hate and it's racism, straight out racism. The George Floyd, you can look at that video. If you had training and you know the training and you know the defensive tactics and you know what you're training, that guy hated him. He was pressuring his knee in his neck. He put all of his weight on his neck and stood up and put his hand in his pocket and you could see him moving his foot while he's grounding his knee in his neck. I was a defensive tactic instructor. It's not training. It's hate, straight out hate. So I'm not gonna say we need training and we need, yes, we need to reform education, police, but defunding the police isn't gonna help. I would never take funding from any police department because they have to protect and serve. It's accountability. You hold them accountable, you get the bad apples out. I supervise sex crimes. And a lot of Lane County sex crimes are little kids. My youngest been two years old case that I have that I'm facing a life in prison right now for the guy. So my kids, K through 12, who I'm elected for the 16th school district, is my passion. And it's us adults to protect and serve those kids. It's not just the police job. It's everybody's job to protect our youth, protect our kids. But we do must go after these departments, whether it's the police, the education, the healthcare, the employment, for accountability. We are all taxpayers, and that's what accountability comes. It's everybody's job to hold them accountable. And so I, sh I share some of that to say that I speak from life's repair. There's some people's, you know, yes, I want the allies, but they haven't had the experience and they haven't had the life experience and they haven't had to sit at the table with anybody black neither. And when it comes down to it, you know who your ally and who your ally isn't. But we need the community to help fix this problem because it's not just our people of color problem, it's everybody problem because your little white kids play with my little black kids. They play with my little Latino kids. They play with my little mixed race kids. They play with my little kids of color. And it hurts them to see their friends get hurt. So it's everybody's problem. Just like every student is my joy, my love, and my protection. And I will be there for them because that's what I'm elected for. I will assure that they get a good quality education. That's my advocacy. I'm to advocate for them. So it's the community to advocate for people of color. All of Linda, us. you have one minute. All of us. And if they're elected and they're not doing it, it's time to get them out of office. We need new faces. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Appreciate you being with us here today. <clears throat>
Um, next, we have uh, the Black Lead Action Coalition. So we've got um, Madeline Smith and Spencer Smith. We'll wait for Bobby to transfer them over. Can everyone hear and see? Awesome. Madeline's on here as well. Right, perfect. Can I be seen? Can I be heard? I can Wait. hear you, Madeline, but we, you're, I don't think your camera's on. Okay, let me see. Um, oh, my video won't turn on. There you are. Oh, perfect. I can see myself now. Do you move your camera just slightly up? I see you. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you, Spencer Mellon, for being with us today. You have 10 minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So my name is Spencer, and I'm a founder of Action Coalition. Can you turn it up, please, because I can't hear you. And so for us, uh, as Black Eugene, I would kind of want to run down with you our mission statement and then go into uh, a couple of demands and requests that we have uh, proceeding to the future of Eugene. And so we are an organization fighting for police and prison abolition, uh, knowing that those institutions are just a subsidiary of social and systemic racism. Uh, our overall goal is black liberation and black sovereignty. Uh, and to us, this means a world where it should be IPOC are no longer oppressed, discriminated against, segregated, murdered, dehumanized, or exploited. Instead, what this looks like is a world where BIPOC are given the resources, reparations, opportunity, equity, equality, uh, that is deserved and owed over time. Uh, we want to make it very clear that we understand that we can't negotiate uh, our liberation with modern day slave patrols uh, or terrorist theories like white supremacy or white nationalism. These systems must be abolished and new systems must be reconstructed out of them. Um, so we take an abolitionist approach opposed to a reformist uh, approach. And so Black being a police and prison abolitionist organization, uh, we're looking to defund the police within the near future. Uh, while we know the state and county budget, We'll immediately defund the police entirely. We ask that resources be directed towards police department that are directed towards police departments be reallocated. Uh, we look for funding to be directed towards de-escalation teams like CAHOOTS uh, and the current school districts that we're seeing right now. And so first, while CAHOOTS deals about 20% of the Eugene Police Department's phone calls, uh, particularly emergency calls, they adopt less than 5% of the police department's budget. Uh, the police department receives about $80 million while CAHOOTS is given $2 million. Uh, dollars each year. This would mean allocating $18 million to CAHOOTS uh, to kind of bring up that equity for them to be able to have the same amount of funding uh, with the situations that they're dealing with consistently. Uh, this would look like giving them the ability to pay employees equitably, have the resources to aid certain crises, uh, and have the means to expand as well. We also uh, know that this process of defunding the police will result in the demilitarization of the Eugene Police Department. Uh, for instance, in 2017, President Trump repealed an executive order allowing the police departments uh, in the United States to obtain military weapons without any restrictions. Uh, to be precise, about six or to be precise, six billion dollars of excess Department of Defense property was transferred to the U.S. law enforcement agencies, meaning that anything from laptops to assault rifles could be passed from the military to the police. Uh, with limited funding, uh, like defunding the police, we know that weaponry can that is used by the police that leads to assault and murder. Uh, particularly of those who are marginalized in BIPOC citizens and non-citizens uh, would no longer be as accessible. So our first request is looking into defunding uh, the police reallocating into CUTS and another form of reallocation could be into our education system. Uh, what this looks like is we want a full review of equity, diversity, and inclusion within Lane County school districts. Uh, education is such an important aspect uh, to growing people's social identities um, and can lead to one uh, exercised and reviewed pr uh, correctly uh, can limit the biases, prejudice, racism, and colorism that goes on within our schooling. And so we want a full review of the Lane County School Districts and evaluation of students of colors and their experience um, so that Lane County School Districts can deserve or can distribute an equitable and equal education experience upon every student alongside the opportunity that's given to them. Uh, furthermore, this looks like giving Lane County School Districts more funding in order to support students that are marginalized in particular. Uh, funding for counselors, nurses, transportation, social services, and creating an inclusive curriculum to support BIPOC and those who are marginalized. Um, other than that, that's the material that we've prepared for you guys today. 
And my sister and I do have two or three questions that we'd like you guys to ask yourselves is, do you feel confident representing everyone in your community, uh, particularly being in a position of power? How do you rep represent those who are marginalized and those who are brutalized? Uh, and if you do feel like an equitable and equitable representative force, uh, how are you showing it within your community? And so with that, we yield the rest of our time and thank you guys. Thank you, Spencer. Appreciate it. Madeline, do you have anything to add? Uh, 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 oh. Uh, oh, oh God. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I had to, can you guys hear me? I had to like use this sound on my phone and log in on here. Um, I don't, Spencer put that beautifully. He does every time and yeah, I think that that's exactly what we needed to say. And I think that that question uh, that last bit is very important for all of you guys to think about, sit on, and answer, and act upon whatever your answer is. So that's all on my end. Perfect. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. At this time, we'll um, shift over to comment. As a reminder, um, I know Fabio has a running list of folks um, who are here to provide public comment. Um, we ask folks um, stick to three minutes or less for public comment. Um, I know Fabio has a running list of folks that would like to write public comment. So uh, Fabio, I'll, um, could you tell us how many folks have signed up so far? We have five so far. Okay. So we've got five folks so far. Um, as a reminder, if you are on the attendee list and would like to write public comment, um, you are able to do so. Who's the first person? Uh, our list is Andy uh, Darnell, followed by Jan Smith. Okay. One second. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. Three minutes, go ahead. All right, thank you. My name is Andy. I'm reading a statement from a Black Jewish non-man in the community at their request. My name is Jay St. James, and for the past three years, the UG Police Department has been harassing, intimidating, threatening, and actively harming my family and myself. Those interactions have increased in frequency and in severity in the past two years, ranging from demanding a FaceTime call with my six-year-old to interrogate him about vandalism, attempting to illegally detain me in a private room while my eight-year-old child recorded for my safety, to sending the previously unnamed officer Christopher Drum, who was complicit in the murder of Eliborio Rodriguez Jr., to stalk me for three days before raping me. In all of these instances, I have done nothing but demand that my constitutional rights not be violated. I do not invite the cops into my life. I'm not a criminal. I'm just a black non-man who knows my constitutional rights and will not let them be violated. When I found out that the Eugene Police Department not only has a history of violating the constitutional rights of non-whites, but is so invested in violating them and preserving white supremacy that they created a division called street crimes to identify suspicious groups, I had an ethical and civil duty to speak up. The more I spoke up, the more I was harassed. I'm from Texas, and in Texas, your racist neighbor isn't going to let taxpayer dollars be wasted consistently harassing non-whites, not because they're not racist, but because they have a vested interest in preserving my rights because they sure as hell don't want theirs infringed upon. In Eugene, that's not the case. Oregon was founded as a whites-only state. I know folks think the Pacific Northwest is a liberal paradise, but that white supremacy doesn't just disappear. Instead, it became a caste system that, based on ideal whiteness, proximity to whiteness, and respectability, where clearly the top tier is white cisgendered heterosexual men. Now in Texas, we have a saying that your rights end where my face begins. It is, it is a reflection of Texas being a constitutional state, but in Oregon as a black non-man, my rights end where the bottom of the next person's caste begins. The reason why I believe I'm being targeted and perceived as such a threat for simply not allowing my constitutional rights to be violated and speaking up when I see the rights of other non-whites violated is because in this caste system, I'm the bottom block in a game of Jenga. All pushback that I've received has been out of the fear that if I'm allowed to vocalize these violations, the entire caste system and hierarchy of white supremacy that Eugene has worked so hard to build will crumble. Charlie Landeros was within their constitutional rights to legally open carry. Eliborio Rodriguez Jr. was within his rights to file his intent to sue the Eugene Police Department for harassment. The entire Eugene Police Department, by allowing the street crimes unit to exist, is violating the Constitution. EPD is taking roughly 70 
$90 million of taxpayer money to violate the constitutional rights of non-white residents. I also wanted to address that the call for organizations given 10 minutes to speak was not based on any public input and did not include notable survivors of police violence, but merely a cherry-picked unit of organizations selected by a cherry-picked group appointed by the city council that a majority of the town currently has contempt with. As I have personally reached out to both Serena Nugent and one other member of the HRC at many times over the years of my harassment, and no assistance or suggestions have ever been provided, yet information was gathered on me and my family by these people in both instances. I feel that shows the individual members are in clear violation of the mission and purpose of the HRC, and I contest the entire legitimacy of the Human Rights Commission. Fuck you all. Who's next, Fabio? Janice Smith, followed by Rachel Eight. Okay. Well, Janet next. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Jennifer Smith, and I'm part of a diverse group of people actively supporting Trey Stewart. Um, there are around 300 of us, a mix of BIPOC, LGBTQIA, alter-abled people, unhoused people, and white cis women and men. I fall into the category of white cis women. Um, Trey's live stream right now of Black Unity protests or other protest events around town frequently have between 30 and 40,000 views. This Facebook page is reaching 10,000 people. I, I want to point out that Gracie's petition to defund the EPD and give money to Cahoots had 11,000 signatures. Th this is not just like the 20 people that are showing up to give public comment. Okay, this is a this is a legit um, movement that has a lot of eyes on it. So I would just say the eyes of the city are on this issue right now. Um, uh, I personally support the demands of Black Unity, BIPOC Liberation Collective, and uh, uh, Black Led Action coalition. I, I don't think you can go too far with uh, dismantling EPD. Um, I want to thank you for giving Black Unity and BIPOC Liberation Collective and, and uh, Bill AC, the, the or, uh, Black Eugene, the um, platform to speak. Uh, I am 100% behind the dismantle and defund. Um, also, I want to say this city has a long history of militarized police and aggression towards peaceful protesters. I moved here in 1996. I remember uh, 97 uh, uh, tree uh, sitter protesters being uh, brutalized by police. I'm going to say the same thing's happening now, except we have a progressive mayor and the police are more militarized and more aggressive. And Mayor Venice on Friday, July 3rd, made the statement, quote, we actually have an underfunded police department. That's how big the disconnect is here. Okay. Moving on to my next point. Uh, Black Unity very much cares about the unhoused. They've been doing great work. Um, did an event with poor Eugene, feeding 500 people and giving out 800 sandy packs or kits. They are a, a friend, the unhoused. Um, I have been speaking to my unhoused friends and they say that what they need is someplace safe that is yours, not just one night and, and leave the next day warming hut, you gotta go. They need security for themselves and their belongings. They need help with what do you need to get back into a house. They need sanitation, hand wash stations, and bathrooms. And they would like you to fund Nightingale, Dusk Till Dawn, Families First, Opportunity Village Eugene and the Constega Huts, and Cahoots. Uh, thank you very much. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have Rachel followed by Silver. Okay. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Rachel Hammock. I'm an um, almost 19 year resident of Eugene, Oregon. And up until last Wednesday, I had no idea how our government was run um, locally. I had the um, pleasure, honestly, of talking to Mayor Venice last Wednesday for an hour and 15 minutes. We covered a wide variety of topics, but the first question I asked her was, what is your role as mayor? Um, what kind of power does your role as mayor have? I was informed that the way our city government is run is we have a uh, city council, weak mayor, um, and a city manager. 
So what does that mean? Um, it means that city council are the people who are in charge of passing policy. The city manager is in charge of, um, of sorry, I'm a little frazzled from some of the previous comments that were very disturbing um, and upsetting to hear about. Um, the city manager is in charge of enforcing policy and uh, Mayor Venice's role is influencing uh, local government and city council. What that tells me is she has very little power. Um, I also found out that the way that uh, currently our departments are set up is that the Department for Housing, Education, and Healthcare, the three main things that um, all of these coalitions are asking for um, police funds to be reallocated to are run by the county. I was really disturbed and disappointed to find that out. Um, it is my suggestion of the Human Rights Commission that we make a formal suggestion to City Council to take back these departments from the county um, and to start our own departments for housing, um, education, and healthcare. It does not feel right for a group of outsiders from outside of the city to be making decisions about how the second largest city in Eugene or in Oregon is run. Um, and my biggest takeaway was everything involving um, housing with the unhoused. I mean, the sweep I saw, t I got to see drive past the sweep today um, and was very um, angry when I saw it. Um, but that we don't have anywhere to go. I understand that, um, so city council, um, you know, I understand that city council is doing what they can, um, but my, also, my bigger takeaway from talking with the mayor was that there's a lot of restrictions that are, um, put upon city council and what we, the kind of change we can actually make due to the role of um, the county and the county commissioner's board. Um, so, you know, that's something for me without, I found out, you know. Hey, Rachel, you have about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, my main takeaway is it's not gonna be as simple as other cities that have um, a more, um, that have a mayor that has more power, a city council that has more power to make change in our city. Um, and that is directly related to how our city has been run for the last, you know, however long and how city charter is written. We need to collaborate with city council to rewrite this charter so that way we can actually make palpable change to happen in the city. And until that happens, we're basically going to be talking to deaf ears and no change is going to be able to be made. Um, yeah, that's what, that's all I got. I'll, uh, that, that's it. Thanks. I'll yield my time. Thanks. Next, Fabio. We will have Silver followed by Claire Kerwin. All right. Hello. Hey, Silver, go ahead. So um, thank you to the Human Rights Commission for putting this on. I am speaking partially on behalf of LULAC. Um, for those of you who don't know, LULAC is a national organization that started in 1929. We are the last national convention that JFK attended the night before his assassination. We started the Head Start schools, established the precedents for Brown versus Board of Education, along with a number of other uh, nationally recognized things that the uh, LULAC has started. So uh, briefly, LULAC does stand behind the Black Lives Matter movement. We do feel that um, there's a change that's taking place and we uh, will, um, we, we support that change that's taking place. I personally wanna recognize that that change is taking place because people are in the streets protesting, not because we're writing resolutions and not because of elected officials, and not because of any kind of policy matters that are just slowly making their way down to these levels where we're, we're seeing these changes. Um, those policy matters are, those policies are uh, making some change and we do appreciate some of the steps that um, Governor Brown has instituted. But um, there's a number of, cases that haven't been addressed. And I wanted to bring up that Vanessa Guillen, a Latina who signed up to serve her country, was killed because of domestic violence on the behalf of someone who raped her. 
uh, Carlos Adrian Ingram Lopez is a man who was choked and killed in his home in Arizona. Um, he was having uh, difficulty. Uh, he was having some sort of, a, of an uh, um, episode is what they, they said. And his grandmother called 911. The police came and they uh, killed him in his garage with his family there watching and asking. Um, these issues are, are things that we need to keep in mind and consider that it's, it's I, I know that um, we're, we're addressing some of the other issues like George Floyd, but I want to remember some of the Latinos who are also being killed. And um, I, want to, I want to address the fact that there's been mention of a task force that the city of Eugene is supposed to take uh, and put on that will address racism in the city. I personally, as a commissioner, had said that um, for the EPD, that we should have the EPD, the CRB, and the HRC um, have members on that task force so that we can start looking at some of the different issues that have been taking place in our own backyard. Yes, racism happens here in Eugene. It's not some thing that we, we uh, you know, we, we, um, we, should, we shouldn't uh, disagree with that. But um, I would invite you, the rest of you members, to press the city on that creation of that task force and that we start to look at some of the different issues that uh, people of color have, Black, Indigenous, people of color have, have been uh, facing in, in our own backyard. Thanks, Silver. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Claire is no longer on the list, so we have Maya followed by Gracie. Okay. Thanks, Fabio. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Maya. Hi, my name is Maya Wagner, and I'm originally from Israel. I moved here in 2006, and I always encountered racism. Um, one instant in which uh, my family encountered racism is when my dad got harassed by, by a white supremacist during um, coming back home from uh, his business trip. So I have some things to address here. And um, yeah, I hope I won't keep you too long. And uh, since I've encountered racism, the people that always stood by me are the people that are Black, Indigenous, people of color, and people of color. And now I want to stand up for them. I want to demand that you not only defund the police and relocate the fund to uh, social services, Cahoots, White Bird, but you also think about the safety of Black, Indigenous, people of color, and people of color when they are protesting. Just not, not long ago, Isaiah was hit and run and have Travis Lollery still around is disgusting. He should be in jail for a hit and run. And there's a hundred people who have witnessed and let you guys know, like the council, uh, the, the county, let uh, Lucy Vinny, let EPD know that this, it, this is not okay. And uh, for us to provide also videos, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's it's crazy to me. Um, I also want to address that um, security and work is also important for a lot of people of color, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, Pacific Islanders, Middle Eastern, Asians, trans community, the LGBTQA and all have not been feeling secure coming back to work because some places like Off the Waffle is not really accepting to all. So I would like to have that be one of the things that you consider. Um, uh, also, when I was in middle school and high school, actually uh, middle school, 
at end of middle school, close to high school, we used to have a clinic. Yes, a clinic with nurses and nurse practitioners and counselors in schools. And I want to have that for available for the public, especially for people of color and for black indigenous people to be able to run, as said before, instead of SROs who don't even fit for the job, in my opinion. And um, a few last things before we go. Um, I've heard uh, from previous people that we need to have better shelters for a homeless community. Just hearing about how people were forced out of their places just got me in disgust and in more of a demand to make a difference and help out. So please step up. Um, and lastly, before um, I would like to log off and yield my time. I would like to also mention that in schools, um, when they're talking about Black people and Black community, there it's just been glazed over in history classes. So I think we should just add like a whole segment for history classes to talk about um, the oppression they've been dealing with um, since the beginning of time and also not just in schools but also just talk about it in our in our work um yeah, and, time is up. okay that's it that is all i yield my time we'll have now gracie followed by zondi Hi. Hello. Hi. Go ahead, Gracie. Oh, thank you. Um, firstly, I just want to thank you guys for having this meeting and for highlighting people of color in our community and listening to them. And I, you know, I started the petition to defund the police department and reallocate 30% of the budget to CAHOOTS. I, I did it just looking at some numbers and it took off. You know, over 12,000 people, almost 13,000 people have signed it now. And since that, I've also just dived headfirst into this world of city politics. And I'm starting to recognize some of your faces quite well. Um, Amanda McCluskey, I saw you on the police commission and the WeCU board. Eve, I already know you from Cafe Soraya because I worked at Newman's Fish Market. I met you at Chef's Night Out. Um, I've seen a number of your faces, Emily Semple, I've, I've been at the council meetings and the emergency work sessions. And yeah, I really appreciated the We See You board and everything you guys discussed there. I've learned some really disturbing things, things that some of you guys, I'm sure, if not all of you already know. I learned about officers, Lara and Magania, and how they serially sexually assaulted women in our community and went unchecked for a long time and that that's why we have our civilian review board and that's why we have our police auditor. I learned that police auditor Don Reynolds was fired in 2010 after being too anti-police and um, we hired a more police friendly police auditor. Um, I learned that the civilian review board can create policies like the de-escalation policy but that the police department has no obligation to report on their disciplinary actions in upholding those policies. I learned that the man who killed Elaborio Rodriguez Jr. was not even reported as having gone against the de-escalation policy. Um, I do want to defund the police, but I also understand that taking money immediately away from the police department would only make them angry and, and probably cause more distrust in the community. And so I believe that the plan is not in looking right down in front of us, but in lifting our eyes up and looking towards what would prevent crime in our community and, and listen to the voices of the people of color in our community and, and, and provide for the people that are unhoused and start I see that we, we've led this incredible national example with CAHOOTS. We could, we could do more. Everyone's looking towards Eugene and looking towards CAHOOTS. What if we had a homeless shelter 
that had job training programs to, for a homelessness task force, where people who had been unhoused were then trained to help care for the unhoused. Thank like you, what, okay, sorry, I'll yield that little time I don't have left. <laughs> Thank you for your time. You. And just as a reminder to folks, you're welcome to submit your, your public comment to us via email as well. Um, uh, next, we have Zonji, followed by Matthew Yuk. Great. And Zonji, please uh, state your full name. Hi, and my name is Zonji Zinke. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, here I'm, I'm here for two reasons. The first, I'll just say my partner and I, well, uh, in 2018, Mayor Vinnie wrote me a personal letter suggesting that I house people in my backyard because there was just no place for them to go, but it was a priority for the city to site places for people to sleep. That was in 2018. I have allowed several people on the property to sleep on our property. Um, of nine people that we've had over the two years, Five of them have been black. Currently, there is a 75-year-old white woman. She had her 75th birthday on the curb and a black man. The city is threatening us with fines of $2,000 a day for having them on our property. We have priorly ha allowed people behind the fence, but in a pandemic, our children, we live on a stand substandard sized lot. Our children have no place to be outside except our little side yard. So we have allowed people to be on the planting strip and on our front yard, and we are being um, threatened with $2,000 a day fines. Um, the allegiance that, that we have offered, the city could reach out to us and reach out to the people. They have done nothing. And so now they are, you know, anyway, make of that what you will. It's disgusting. Um, I'm here also to talk in solidarity with the BIPOC call for police abolition because reform won't work. I will tell a quick story about the vehicular assault on the black non-man uh, that is not being talked about that happened on May 31st at High Street and 8th Avenue at the, black, at the largest of the Black Lives Matter marches, protests. And the Travis Cannon is the name of the driver he intentionally, he, uh, there was a black non-man standing in the street directing traffic around their body and Travis Cannon chose to drive within one to two inches of this person's legs. This person said, do, do not touch my body. And then Travis Cannon drove forward into this person. Okay, I tried to, I don't, uh, I'm frankly, was hesitant to talk to police because I know where their solidarity is, where you know that they, they who they do and don't serve. They would not even take a witness statement. I find when I finally contacted them, it was four days later, and they said they had done been finished investigating and they were not taking any witness statements. So one thing we can understand is that the black non-man who was hit by Travis Cannon, this, there's two Travises that have uh, uh, ve committed vehicular assault on protesters now, the, that per person knows that. Thank you, Zondi, your time is up. The police are not an ally and does not, which you heard about tonight. Allies, allies don't go to the police. So abolition is the only way. Thank you, Zondi, appreciate it. Who's next, Fabio? You're on mute, Fabio. Uh, Matthew Yuk is the last person in my list. Okay. And if the other folks on the line that want to provide a comment, please um, shoot a message to Fabio. Go ahead, Matthew. Hi there. Um, my name is Matthew Yuk, and as with other folk, I'd like to echo a appreciation of the idea that BIPOC voices need to be included in the discussion of community safety and community health for everyone, especially as has been brought up the intersection of housing issues, BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus communities. 
that is something that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with that Eugene has been talking about facing and confronting for more years than it seems to be organizing money around supporting organizations and building other spaces where people can have wraparound services, where people are safe and not feeling persecuted for how they might not look like everyone else, which is the root of the police violence and the broken windows policy that is the authoritarian brutality a lot of BIPOC, BIPOC folk are experiencing and expressing out in the streets, I feel. While I am a palatable shade of brown as far as a lot of dominant culture interprets me, still the racism that East Asian folk like I always feel just under that veneer of the purported model minority is coming crashing down as we get assaulted in the streets during this current pandemic. And so the idea that assaults are happening, people get prosecuted, but in our own community when there's eyewitnesses of violence in a hit and run that's felonious against a person in our community, they get to walk free. This is exactly the problem I feel I have heard expressed relating and in regards to the Human Rights Commission and the Eugene Police Commission and the Auditor, as have also been brought up tonight. And so with the idea that the We See You Board is going to be in charge of discussing this new budgetary approach to, a communis uh, to communal holistic health is a little frustrating to me because it seems to be the same people that have been talking about this for however many years when we've not seen the significant change as names I don't want to have to keep hearing heard have to be brought up before we see that accountability. And so right now I don't hear folks talking about either how it's $300,000 more to train or to onboard a new patrol officer as opposed to the 188000 it is to employ one while it's only like 50 to 60K salary they get. Where is that other $128,000 minimally going? How much aid could that help? If we supported Whitebird at those funding levels, how much better would that service be? And so these demands that BIPOC, Liberation Collective, Black Unity, and all these folks that you have gathered and reached out to, which I am thankful for, are amazing, solid, and fantastic. But we need to have the numbers, we need to have action, and we need to make sure that these discussions are making it to the final proposals. And so I implore y'all, please don't think that just because people aren't here, they don't care. This has been one of the problems of the idea of just referring things to more committees of the same people. There's people that can't speak up. And so, please keep reaching out and please know that people are watching. And we know that you, you care about people, right? I think, oh, I, oh, we don't know. I don't wanna speak for them. I wanna say that I know you care about people. That's why you are doing what you are doing. But Thank we've you, got to, sorry. Appreciate it. Looks like we've got, um, you know, apologies if I mispronounce your name. You're uh, No sweat. Hello, I'm Inno. Uh, I'm a white identifying person uh, that is part of the Black Unity Leadership Team. I wanted to draw attention to two specific occasions that I've had with the police. First was with regards to Isaiah Wagner being attacked by a car. Uh, it was reported to the public that Travis Valeri actually called himself in. That is actually not true. He only called the police after team members from Black Unity arrived at his apartment. Now that's important because if that doesn't echo in the deep set racism within the white community in the relationship with the police. I do, know, I do not know what does. A person that committed a hit and run and then called the police to protect himself. Secondly, uh, in the fallout from that event, there was several protests at the jail. After one of these protests at the jail, uh, I was with a friend, we were heading home. We were waiting uh, for his girlfriend to pick us up with her car. We were standing in a parking lot looking for a lighter to smoke a cigarette. We had four police cars pull up on us and at least six officers came out to approach us and ask us why we were trespassing. 
two of these police officers were equipped with automatic rifles with their fingers on the trigger. Now, myself and my friend, we are white identifying people. We have the privilege of being able to walk away from an interaction like this. But I, it just draws the question, like, are we okay with policing like this? What if we were people of color? What if we were uh, black kids that were just walking home and stopped to smoke a cigarette? Would it have been the same? And are we okay with this type of force existing within our community? Thank you. Thank you. Fabio, has anyone else signed up to do public comment? Oh, that was the last person. Okay, I'll give it one more minute. Anyone else on the participant list would like to give public comment? Please send your requests using the Q&A option if you'd like to, to provide comments. I'll give it about a minute. Uh, Joe, there is a written comment by Julie Lambert. Uh, the microphone is not working. Okay. Maybe someone could uh, read it. And we have Chelsea Swift. So I'll put Chelsea on. Maybe we can get a commissioner to read the, the comment. Sounds good. Let's have Chelsea go first and then we'll do Julie. Hello. So many familiar faces and voices on here. Uh, this is Chelsea Swift from Kahoot, and kind of as always, I'm like here as my own human and um, feel the intersections in this community um, in my work and kind of like my presence more than ever as I know we all are. So I'm just kind of here to honor those intersections in that work and um, I think the most powerful gift we have to, for each other uh, is the power of us all feeling really seen by each other in our work right now. Um, whether that has been like Spencer of Huge Black who has been providing non-complicit -bi bias trainings to Cahoots uh, before George Floyd was killed, before our uprising and um, to Black Unity for having like beautiful barbecues in Washington Jefferson Park last week just revolutionarily like turning that space that eyesore that a um, hundred emails displaces a hundred people for like that is some of the most beautiful acts of protest I've seen for the communities that I'm often working alongside of and today with um, even further expressed intention from BIPOC LC with um, supporting people who are being swept and I think right now, like, I just ask you all to join us at, like, the level of, um, like, I know personally, I, I just listened to, like, a podcast of Sean King, and we were on All Things Considered, and uh, every national news outlet, it is kind of wild, because then I still go on shift, and I'm standing on the sidewalk with somebody, and I have absolutely nowhere to bring them, and it's raining, and it's a pandemic, and I know they're probably going to go to jail if I cannot help them, so... Um, please like join us at this level of critique and conversation and um, help us build to the solution that we're being um, exalted as being. And, and we all know that abolition is going to look like us all working together, whether that goal is abolition or whether your goal is just to be humane and help solve these goals that we all agreed were goals a long time ago. So. Thank you to this group. Thank you to everyone listening. I am really in love with everyone who I've been surrounded by for many years now in this town. So thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, it looks like that is um, the end of the public comment period. So at this time, we have about 25 minutes left. Um, I was mm -hmm. hoping we would have a little bit of time and it, and it did happen. So at this point, um, uh, Fabio, unless there's anyone else, I'd there is like, the written one in the Q&A. Uh, can you all see that one? Yeah, I think we can all read it. Um, it would be good for someone to read it just to have it on the record. Anyone want to volunteer to read it? Go ahead, Serena. You're on mute, Serena. <laughs> um, OK, this is a comment from Julie Lambert. 
um, she makes three points. Number one, both Mayor Venice and Chief Skinner are on record as saying that if we, that if they have more, have to move unhoused, they want to be able to tell them where to go, what happened to their mutual wishes, which are echoed by the community, as well as the, as the people who can't be there because they are busy surviving. Number two, now that could, Cahoots is a model for the nation. Why can't we move more money from policing tickets and destroying a person's meager possessions? Uh, on make our most vulnerable much worse off. Three, can you address the hit and run of Isaiah? Why is the driver free? Thank you, Julie with KEPW. Thanks, Serena. Appreciate it. Um, it's 7.07. Uh, we've got about 20 something minutes left. So at this time, what I would like to do is um, we've heard a, a number of comments from organizations as well as individuals. Um, so I think I'd like to use the rest of the time for today. Uh, take, I'd say two minutes per commissioner just to provide some feedback and reflections. Um, if anyone is not okay with that, please raise your hand. Okay, so I think with that, we'll do two, try to keep it at two minutes each. I think if we do it two minutes each, we'll, we should get out of here on time. Um, and I wanna be respectful of people's time. So who wants to go first? Raise your hand. Go ahead, Ibrahim. You're on mute, Ibrahim. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you, Joel. I am Thank you all for being here today. Um, we've been talking about police reform for, for a while now. Um, I remember um, back in the days when I moved here newly, there was already conversation about police reform with Chief Kearns at that time. And uh, we had uh, Chief um, Skinner came in. For what I can remember, there were three police involved deadly shooting that I can remember because I had conversation about those shooting uh, when they happened. The first was Brian Babs. Brian Babs was a veteran uh, with a diagnosed PTSD, well known. Uh, at least uh, the police was aware of his PTSD when they went on scene because they were called actually by his uh, therapist for a welfare check. So keep in mind, someone who's a veteran and has PTSD and is in a mental crisis, the police roll in with the SWAT team, heavily armed and uh, heavily armed and, and, and you know, want to handle the situation. Long story short, they end up killing him. Then came Landeros. They killed Landeros. Then came Rodriguez, a man who had been bullied by the police before at the University of Oregon. And the police officer on scene end up having equipment failure with his, the camera in his car off, he killed Landeros, uh, uh, Rodriguez, sorry. So here we are again. We try at, this, at the, 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 the a regular meeting of HRC to bring in Brian Michaels, who's a civil rights lawyer, to talk to HRC about de-escalation. That was before George Floyd. Now we have George Floyd and we are hey, talking your, about- Your time is up, wrap up real quick. Right. I'm gonna wrap up. So I think at this point, this is what we need to do as, as a community. It is to find that one thing that make police officers always being afraid when it's come to dealing with black and brown people and poor white people. Because the same people who are killing black and brown people are the same who are harassing homeless people on the street. How can you arrest a homeless person who want to pee 
at 2 o'clock in the morning where they do not have any bathroom to go to. There is nowhere for them to go. Do you want them to fall down to their pee to go to the library and pee at 8 o'clock? I think we as a commission, we can do better. We just have to go heads on and tackle the issue of police brutality in our community. It is here in Eugene. We don't need to go to Minneapolis in Eugene here. So I'm going to I'm gonna uh, um, leave it there because I have uh, uh, only three minutes and uh, people have been on this call for so long. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, Ibrahim. Appreciate it. Yeah. Who wants to go next? I would like to just uh, have sacrificed my time to Ibrahim's extra time and just thank everyone for coming and speaking today and let them know that we will be um, taking all that everybody had to say into account and I'm sure that it will bring it into our retreat in August uh, as well um, for much deeper discussion. Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks, Bonnie. Appreciate I it. I appreciate that. So <laughs> here, here's yeah, black people. Yeah. I'm we, can we have other folks go first, Ibrahim, and then if we have time at the end, we can finish. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I know you've yielded your time, Bonnie, but Ibrahim went for three minutes and you went for one. Uh, so I want to hear from other folks first, and then Ibrahim, I'll prom I'm going to keep mine short so we can give you some more time. <laughs> Who wants to go next? Go ahead, Ibrahim. You're on mute, Ibe. Is that better? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I am uh, very thankful for everybody that spoke. It's been very enriching and educational. Uh, uh, though I agree with just about everything that's been said, the need for reform is vital. Uh, one underlying uh, theme that everybody uh, mentioned, uh, though not by name, is uh, the injustice that everybody's feeling and the need for justice. And I am not sure that some folks are aware that the narrative that they hold on is so precious to them, even when they know it's wrong, they're not always able to change it because for one, they don't have another narrative to latch onto. Secondly, it takes a little while for that change to, for the education of that, that makes that change happen, happen. So though I want things to change instantly, I wanna snap my finger and see things changed. I th think there's some wisdom in making sure that the narrative that we want to create is a just narrative that allows for people that have no other narrative, no education, never sat with a black person, never sat with a brown person, never sat with an indigenous person, a chance to learn because you cannot make something happen without filling the inside of it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Who's next? Go ahead. Thank you. And thanks to everyone uh, for speaking. Um, I recently heard a podcast with the racism scholar Ibram X. Kendi, and he says that one is either a racist or an anti-racist. There is no room for neutrality and there's no such thing as a non-racist. And I think the same holds true with our public institutions, that it isn't enough merely to reform or even dismantle institutions of systemic racism, that we need to work to build institutions of systemic anti-racism. Um, implicit bias training, for example, can uncover the problems of racial prejudice and racist stereotypes among individuals, but it doesn't answer the question of how to change institutions whose policies and practices have been based on racist ideas. Um, 
So what does an anti-racist police department look like? Uh, the police being um, probably emblematic of systemic racism more than any other institution. And I'm not sure I know what an anti-racist police department looks like, but I know that we as a community must actively engage in that conversation. And um, that conversation took place tonight. And I know that many more conversations will take place in the future. Lives are at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Let's go next. Go ahead, Kirsten. I don't have a lot to say. I just I'm going to echo what other folks said. I, just, I really appreciate um, everyone being here today and speaking um, and informing and educating and educating themselves. I agree with Bonnie. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that this meeting is happening right before we have our retreat so that we can make plans. Um, and ensure that our work groups are doing the work that we need to do and just, you know, it's time for reform. Um, and I look forward to all the work that we have tasked to do in front of us. Hey, Kirsten, what's going on? Councilor Semple. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone coming tonight. I know that it takes a whole diversity of tactics to make this happen. And I appreciate the protests that keep our, our minds on this energy that's so critical. And I appreciate people coming here and I am sure to counsel to tell us what they think. Um, it's essential to me to hear from everybody and um, you're welcome to ask me to meet with you outside of here because it's people's information and experience and emotions. We all have them. We need to sit down together and listen. We do need reform. We need careful reform so it turns out to be equitable. I know that the energy is high and we want changes right now. I have to be committed to looking at everything carefully and taking enough time to hear from all of the groups. And so this was huge to come tonight and listen to you. It is certainly not easy. It's hard work and I'm committed to it. And I thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simple. Who would like to go next? Go ahead. So I don't um, have a lot to say, um, but I did want to say that I'm really grateful for all of the folks who spoke today. I think the information that was provided to us is invaluable and will be incredibly helpful as we figure out what we're doing uh, and building our work plans over the next year. Um, and it's, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a lot to take in, but it's, it's, it's incredibly helpful. And I really am grateful for everyone's time. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Serena, Heather, uh, Rick, go ahead, Rick. So I'd just like to thank everybody and uh, for their comments and really appreciate their involvement in um, participating in this, uh, this evening's meeting. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really large discussion and it's not one that's easily solved. Um, and, you know, I've been in Eugene for 40 years and I have worked in city government, I've worked outside of city government. and. You know, police have always been an issue and, and the approach to policing has always been an issue. There's, there's been a number of different types of reforms that have tried to happen, you know, from community policing to traditional policing, you know, to, you know, now, you know, militaristic policing, I guess. Um, and it's a never, it's a never ending conversation. And I do think that, that we need to really be cautious about how we move forward and how we envision um, what we do with our policing efforts. Um, I, th I think the efforts with uh, merging some of the social services and actions with cahoots and, and the bringing them into situations <clears throat> is very helpful and I'd like to see that model continue and be expanded. Um, but I, I think it's more than just 
the policing effort. I think it, it's a lot of um, institutionalized racism and policies that are within city government that also need to be looked at. And so um, um, those are my thoughts right now. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time and commitment to um, having their voices heard. And I, and I hope they continue to come to our meetings because that's the, that's the real thing is that these are, this is the most participation we've had in any of our meetings since I've been on the board for two years. And so I'd like to hear those voices at every meeting. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Serena, go ahead. I just want to say that, you know, as I was listening to um, the, the public testimony, I didn't, you know, it's a lot of what I hear every day um, on social media, and I follow Trey's live feeds a lot, and um, I just, I follow this every spare minute I basically can when I'm raising my kids at home, and there is, the public is watching, and there is um, a great deal of energy, and um, I'm worried about it kind of getting diluted and filtered through the city bureaucracy, um, losing the sense of urgency and just kind of going nowhere. Cause there are, we've had emergencies, you know, we've had things that seem like they should be at the crisis level and it just doesn't feel like it, that the action, balances the the sense of urgency of the people really experiencing the human rights violations and i you know we've got a number of commissions and boards and it just feels like our power is pretty limited um but i want whatever we do to not just invite people to public comment but to give more of a seat at the table versus like you know, inviting people to just give a little comment because whatever we're voting for, we're already probably gonna vote for things that would reflect that community. But I think maybe we need to find a way to have those voices more immediately in front of the people who can actually make a difference. And I just, I don't know how that will look mechanically, but I'm not sure we're the right people for it. I, I would like to see more youth and more of that energy directly in front of the people who can make the decisions. Thanks, Serena. Heather? Uh, I would just like to um, speak to something that really struck, stuck with me was uh, Linda Hamilton, her questions. Is it true? Is it good? Does it benefit all? And I feel like that really speaks to the heart of what we're doing at this point. Um, we, our city is following harmful practices against some of our citizens. We need to stop that. Um, we need to have that new narrative. I absolutely agree with that. And uh, we need to look at the infrastructure that has enabled racism and to dismantle that um, while still looking to uh, LULAC and NAACP as uh, guiding lights that have been doing this work all along. So to, to join with those who, um, who, who we can rise uh, you know, with and uh, to really work together uh, to make some significant changes. Thanks, Heather. Does anyone else besides myself not had a chance to speak yet? Okay, I'm gonna time myself real quick. Well, again, thank you all to my fellow commissioners for being here today, and thank you to the community members and the groups um, that um, agreed to be with us. Thank you to uh, my co-organizers, Ella and, and Bonnie, for inviting um, you know NAACP and, of course, uh, Blacks in Government to attend. Um, I myself have reached, thank you to um, the organizers of Black Unity, uh, Eugene Black um, and uh, BIPOC Collective. We've been on the phone for the last few days and weeks um, trying to, to figure this out. So I'm, I'm very glad they were able to join us today. Um, and also, right, I just want to remind uh, the, the commissioners of our recent actions we've taken. One, sending a letter to council, asking them to, to be um, really brave and to continue to support uh, to folks, especially as we see these white supremacists and white nationalists on our streets antagonizing people and targeting folks. Uh, we also sent a resolution 
uh, that was drafted by commissioners, um, you know, on the call today. And of course we tinkered with it last time and, you know, we did have some really concrete asks. Um, one of which was stopping the use of crowd control weapons, you know, from chemical irritants to disorientation weapons to water cannons. And then of course, we also asked for the reallocation of funds away from the Eugene Police Department towards the community centered health and safety model. Um, you know, and, and I myself, you know, I, and I'm sure like many of you have been talking about this for a long time. I mean, I've been years and years that I've been talking about law enforcement um, on this commission, off this commission, as a teenager, as someone in my 20s and now someone approaching 30, I'm, I'm, I've had enough. Now we've had enough, right? Enough of discrimination and violence that threatens the safety of black indigenous and people of color, um, both here in Eugene and the county and our state and our country and in the world. Um, and so I'm, I'm really proud to continue to, to try to fight for the folks in our city. And I'm glad that this commission made um, the decision to ask for the relocation of funds um, so that we can and make investments instead that will allow this community to thrive. And that's what our people deserve. And that's what um, our mission should be. Um, so I'll stop there. It's uh, 728. Uh, Ibrahim, I promised you I'd give you some extra time. So you got two minutes. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Bonnie, for uh, yielding and giving me the rest of your time. What I, I want to say is, um, you know, most of the time when we talk about police reform or criminal justice reform, we, we forget the district attorneys. And the district attorneys are the one uh, who are technically supposed to investigate and charge or not whenever there is a po police officer involved, uh, uh, either shooting or there is a complaint against a police officer. And most of the time, we all know that those uh, DA come and say, well, we haven't found any wrongdoing and uh, the police officers walk away from uh, uh, you know any charge that it, uh, potentially the victim may uh, be seeking for, for them to have. So in Oregon, there is, I believe, 36 DAs uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, 36 DAs, 17 were appointed by the governor. So they don't go through a, a elections. And the one who uh, went through elections, they were deputy district attorney meaning that there is a continuity, you know, it's, they, they, they were in the office already, and now they are DAs. They, during the election, they get endorsed by the police union. Remember the last election, you have seen on TV here saying that courage grows people, follow your police chief lead and vote for me. The police union endorsed the DA. How the DA can uh, go back and investigate those people in good faith? Thank you. It's not going to happen. So we need to pay close attention to what the district attorney's uh, election are. And, and, and us as a human rights commission, we can probably start that conversation about conflict of interest for police union to endorse the district attorneys uh, during the election. Thanks, Maybe Ibrahim. the we county gotta... can go that route or the state can go that route. Thanks, Ibrahim. we got to wrap up. Um, hey folks, sorry Bonnie, we gotta wrap up. I told folks 7.30. Really quick, please. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. I just wanna ask for anybody in the public who, um, or in our community who spoke tonight, um, whether you were scheduled or not, um, it would be really nice to get whatever you have, whatever you offered tonight in writing. I know it was mentioned that you can do that if, if you'd like to, but I just wanted to put in a pitch that it would be helpful for us to have that in writing. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone who participated today. Thank you to my fellow commissioners. Um, appreciate uh, you all being with here us um, with, with us today. A reminder that we will be having a meeting later this month. Um, and then the, myself and uh, Vice Chair uh, McCluskey will be meeting with the Mayor and City Manager um, sometime this summer to discuss what we heard today and also uh, what we've been hearing the last few months. So rest assured that um, we'll be continuing to fight um, for uh, human rights here in the city of Eugene. Thank you all for coming. It is 731. Can I get a motion to end the meeting? I'll make a motion to end the meeting. Second. 
Wait, Monty, sec who seconded Eve? Okay, all this. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.